Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This will be part 2 of The Volpine Huntsman of Vale. All credit to the author, their information can be found in the description below, as well as a link to the story if you would like to read along. This will be chapter 4 to 6. Also, don't forget to smash that like button and comment to help with the algorithm. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the story. It had been five days since the incident with the Huntress and Red, and Naruto was all set to begin his third and final year at Signal in two days. He had spent the last five days coming to terms with the fact that he was now a killer. It may have been in defense of someone, and it may have been an accident, but it was still his first kill, and he knew from his time in Kanoha that the first kill was always the hardest. For once, Kurama was actually very helpful, giving Naruto a high-level right on Jutsu to learn. Naruto threw himself into his training for three days, trying to forget what he had done. Of course, it is impossible to forget something like that, and Naruto eventually had to consider the fact that he had killed someone. Two days of actual coping later, as opposed to ignoring the problem, Naruto had come to accept that he had done what was necessary. A shinobi had to be able to take a life for the sake of the village, and a huntsman had to be able to take a life for the sake of the lives around him. You should be thankful that you got this nonsense out of the way, fool, Kurama had told him. This way, you won't freeze up getting your first kill during an actual mission. Besides, the man you killed was worthless. He was weak and deserved what he got. To me, no one is worthless, Sensei. I was called worthless once, and look what I'm capable of now. At the moment, Naruto was water walking to Signal Academy. He needed to pick up his schedule and claim a locker for his final year, and that had to be done in person. While walking on the river, he gathered himself so that he could continue acting as though nothing had changed. He may have accepted his first kill, but he doubted many others would do the same, and he didn't want anyone knowing that something was wrong. As he walked into the entrance of the combat school, Naruto looked around to see if there was anyone he knew. When he saw who was waiting just to the left of the entryway, he immediately paled. The huntress from the rooftop stood with her rider's crop at the ready, prepared to counter any attempts at escape. Well, hello there, Mr. Uzumaki. Did you enjoy your little escapade earlier this week? Naruto swallowed to clear his throat. Um, yes. She narrowed her eyes at him. Now you are coming with me, and there will be no escaping this time. Any attempts will warrant severe consequences. Do I make myself clear? Naruto swiftly nodded. Clear as crystal. The huntress, whom Naruto learned was named Glinda Goodwitch, escorted Naruto to a nearby police station, where she began to give him a lecture. I hope you understand the severity of your actions, Mr. Uzumaki. You interfered in an active combat situation and put yourself in a great deal of danger. You could have been killed or caused the death of someone else. At that point, Naruto flinched visibly and couldn't help but respond. Actually, I'm pretty sure I saved a life by getting involved. You should be thanking me. Goodwitch narrowed her eyes at him. What in the world are you talking about? Before Naruto could answer, the door opened, and a silver-haired man with a cane and a mug of coffee walked in. I think I can answer that question for you, Glinda. With that, he pulled a scroll out of his pocket and played footage from a surveillance camera of Red's fight with the thugs. Oh, so that's how you guys found me, Naruto commented. In the video, an injured thug had just gotten hold of the shaft of Red's scythe. Goodwitch commented. I don't see how Dash, her response was cut off by the sudden appearance of a figure in the background, throwing a glowing kanai. The figure disappeared, and the man who was about to strike down Red was suddenly without part of his arm. Naruto managed to stop himself from flinching this time, but the silver-haired man seemed to notice that something was off. Allow me to slow this down a bit. With that statement, the man with the coffee mug rewound the video a few seconds and replayed it in slow motion. When the figure appeared in the background, he paused the video and zoomed in on a perfect picture of one Uzumaki Naruto, glowing kanai in hand. There was a surprised intake of breath from Goodwitch. I think I see now what you mean. The man then turned his eyes to Naruto. So, Uzumaki Naruto, student at Signal Academy, where in the world did you obtain such an interesting skill set? Naruto sighed and said, I had a couple of teachers outside of school who knew a thing or two. The man took a sip from his mug and raised an eyebrow. Oh, really? And where would one find these teachers? Thinking of Iruka, Jiraiya, and Kakashi, none of whom he would ever see again, Naruto stared at his hands, which were clenched in his lap. They're not around anymore. He supposed that Kurama was still around, but he couldn't exactly tell them about him. The expressions of the two adults softened slightly, and the man set his coffee mug down. I'm sorry to hear that. However, I can see that you are not letting their teachings go to waste, which brings me to my next order of business. 
I think that Signal is perhaps not challenging enough for you. Would you perhaps consider pursuing an education on a more suitable level? Naruto raised an eyebrow. If an opportunity presented itself to me, I'm sure I would probably take it. Well then, allow me to first introduce myself and then present you with such an opportunity. My name is Henzel Ashbin, headmaster of Beacon Academy, and I would like you to attend my school for the upcoming term. Naruto's jaw dropped. You're serious? This is awesome. Ashbin smiled. So, I assume you accept the offer? For the first time in five days, a truly happy expression was on Naruto's face. Of course. Who wouldn't? Excellent. Now then, you will report to the airport this afternoon to board a shuttle to Beacon. Initiation is tomorrow, and it is required that you stay the night at the school. The shuttle will be leaving at 3 o'clock sharp. Don't be late. Naruto gave his new headmaster a salute. Roger that, sir. A few minutes after Naruto had left, Goodwitch said to Ashbin, Well, at least we know what happened to that man now. You didn't tell him that the man his knife struck died from his wounds. Are you planning on telling him? Ashbin took a long drink from his coffee mug. I don't need to. I was watching his reaction to your lecture. When you mentioned that his actions might have cost someone their life, he flinched. His subsequent shouting was to cover up his feelings of guilt. Did you notice that despite the fact that the surveillance video never showed him retrieving his knife, it was never found at the scene? He retrieved it after he became invisible again, which would have brought him close enough to the body to see the state it was in. He knows what he did. I think it's best that we not mention it to him for a while. Glinda Goodwitch's eyes widened at Ashpin's response. She nodded to him and said, I, I wish I had known. I wouldn't have been so harsh with him. Don't you think it's best if we get some help for him? So that he can cope? Ashpin shook his head. He's already begun to come to terms with it on his own. It's best if we let that process complete itself without any interference. That young man is strong. He'll be all right. Vale Airport, 2 colon 43. Naruto had just finished loading up his luggage onto the shuttle and was making his way up the ramp to the passenger area. He was wearing a black t-shirt and blue jeans, his headband and thigh pouch in their usual places. On his belt, he had strapped two sheaths. The sheath on his left side was occupied by Kitsu no Akari, and the one on his right side by Firestorm. He had left his armor, which consisted of forearm guards, shin guards, and a set of black gloves with metal plates on the back, in his luggage for the moment. As he arrived in the passenger area, he noticed a girl with long black hair topped by a black bow wearing a black and white outfit who was near the entrance. When she turned her head to look at the new arrival, he noticed that she had amber eyes. He thought he recognized her from somewhere, but he wasn't sure how he knew her. It wasn't long before the ship took off for Beacon, and Naruto spent most of the ride staring out the window at the amazing view. He heard snippets of conversation going on around him and heard something about bee's knees from a girl off to his right, but he mostly paid them no mind. After a hologram of Professor Goodwitch gave them a short welcome, and a blonde kid with white armor almost puked everywhere from motion sickness, the aircraft landed, and everyone exited the aircraft and headed towards the school. They had been told that their luggage would be brought to the ballroom for them to pick up later, so the new students were free to wander around for a while until the official welcome speech took place in the auditorium. Naruto quickly got ahead of the throng of new students and began exploring. He found several trees that would be excellent for sleeping in on the nights that he felt like resting under the open sky, and also learned the basic layout of most of the school. As he concluded his exploring, he noticed that it was almost time for the official welcome, so he made his way over to the auditorium. As he was walking towards the auditorium, another guy came onto the path he was following from a small grassy area. The guy in question wore a light blue long-sleeved shirt, black jeans, and black arm guards. He had what looked like a black spear strapped to his back and his hair was shoulder-length and black as night. He ended up next to Naruto as they walked towards the auditorium. He nodded to Naruto in greeting. Yo. You a first-year student too? I'm Sharl Ebeni. He held out a hand, which Naruto shook. Is it that obvious? Uzumaki Naruto. Nice to meet you. Charles chuckled. Well, I figured only newbies like us would be headed to the auditorium at this point. Welcome speech to attend and all that. Naruto nodded. Makes sense. They walked in silence for a minute or so before Charles tried to rekindle the conversation. So, what combat school did you go to before this? I was at Signal. Naruto was silent for a few seconds before answering, I was at Signal as well. Charles's eyebrows rose. Really? I don't remember ever seeing you in any of my classes. I thought I knew everyone in my year. I only completed my third year before I got recruited to come here. The dark-haired boy stared at Naruto with an expression akin to awe. Recruited? How in the world did you manage that? 
Naruto shrugged. I might have burned a robber's arm off and shot a few fireballs at some Roman torchwick guy. Charles's jaw dropped. You're serious? Dude, that sounds like one hell of a story. At this point, they had entered the auditorium and moved to stand with a few other students. Naruto shrugged in response to his companion's statement. It's really not that big of a deal. I was just poking my nose in someone else's battle and managed to pick up a little too much attention for it. As they waited, Naruto spotted a girl clad in white, walking up to another girl in a black skirt and a red cloak and yelling at her for something. As the girl in red leapt up into some blonde girl's arms, Naruto's eyes widened as he realized that it was red from the battle against Torchwick. Naruto considered going over there just to find out who she was, but decided against it. Ever since the event that had flung him into this world, Naruto had avoided making any close friends. The betrayal he had felt made him reluctant to trust anyone else. There was a chance that Red would go full-on fangirl because of the stunts he had pulled, and that would make it difficult to keep her at a distance from him. Not to say that he wouldn't be friendly with people, but the furthest he would go in a relationship with someone was the acquaintance level. He would often talk with people and get to know them a bit before dropping most contact with them for a while so that they would gravitate back towards their other friends. It helped that he kept a very intense training schedule that left him little time to make friends or hang out. Naruto's thoughts were interrupted by the start of the welcome speech. Ashpin took the stage and began to speak. I'll keep this brief. You have traveled here today in search of knowledge, to hone your craft and acquire new skills, and when you have finished, you plan to dedicate your life to the protection of the people. But I look amongst you, and all I see is wasted energy in need of purpose, direction. You assume knowledge will free you of this, but your time at this school will prove that knowledge can only carry you so far. It is up to you to take the first step. Naruto took on a confused expression before turning his attention back to the stage when Professor Goodwitch began to speak. You will gather in the ballroom tonight, and tomorrow your initiation begins. Be ready. You are dismissed. Beacon Ballroom, 10.08 p.m. Naruto had just come from the showers and was making his way over to the area that he had laid out his things. He wore black sweatpants and an orange t-shirt for pajamas. He noticed that many guys were choosing to show off for the ladies by being shirtless and he wondered how people would react if they were to see the scars under his shirt. Chidori wound aside, Naruto had a moderate number of scars on his torso, and to a lesser extent his arms and legs. During his time in the elemental nations, Kurama's chakra would heal most wounds without scars, but it had limits. Only so much of it could be channeled in a given period of time without harming him, and if he received wounds repeatedly over a short period of time, they would begin to form scars instead of completely healing. Twice in his life, he had been caught by the villagers on one of their fox hunts. Both of these times had left him with scars from the knives that they had carried with them. He was snapped out of his thoughts by an orange-haired girl popping up in front of him and invading his personal space. Are those whiskers? Naruto took a step back. Um, no. They're birthmarks. A boy with a magenta streak in his hair came up behind the girl, who was still staring at Naruto's whisker marks. Nora, it's rude to get in other people's faces. He then turned to address Naruto. Sorry about her. Naruto shrugged. It's fine. I'm Naruto, by the way. Nice to meet you. I'm Rain. And this is Dash. Rin's introduction was cut off by the energetic girl. I'm Nora. I like pancakes. Naruto raised an eyebrow. Okay. That's nice. I like ramen. The unorthodox conversation was interrupted by two voices simultaneously shouting, Oh, not you again. He turned to see the white-clad girl from the auditorium, who he began to refer to in his head as Hyoheim, facing off with a blonde girl who had assets that would make Aero Sen and drool. Red stood off to the side, and the girl with the black bow sat with a book in her hands next to them. As the argument between Hyoheim and the mini Tsunade continued, Naruto noticed that the girl with the bow was wearing something similar to some of the nightgowns that were worn by women back home. He decided that he would definitely have to find out who this girl was. But at that moment, the lights went out, and Naruto decided that sleep took priority at the moment. As Naruto drifted off, he thought about what this mysterious initiation would involve. Would it be like the Jinin exam? Maybe the Chunin exam? Would they have to fight other students? That last possibility reminded him too much of the Blood Mist Village's Jinin exam. So he ended that train of thought and fell into a restless sleep. Naruto woke up when Nora tried to sneak up on him to rouse him from his sleep. His ninja senses were still as sharp as ever and he almost pulled a kanai out before he could stop himself. As it was, he still leapt up from his prone position and grabbed the wrist of the hand she had put on his shoulder, startling Nora and Ran and making everyone who was awake stare at him. 
He let go of Nora's wrist and scratched the back of his head in embarrassment. Sorry about that. I don't like being snuck up on, and I just kind of reacted. Ren narrowed his eyes, knowing that a reaction like that was usually only seen from hunters who had years of combat experience in the field. Nora just commented excitedly on how it was morning and time to get ready. As Naruto went through all of his morning rituals, he noticed that Nora was pestering Ren with a ferocity that few could match, and Naruto idly wondered if Ren was just used to it or if he was a robot or something. Since Naruto had kept his weapons close to him, he didn't need to go to his locker to get anything. As soon as the announcement came that told them where to report, he headed for the cliffside in what he liked to call his battle outfit. He wore tight-fitting black pants with bandages wrapped around his shins underneath. His shin guards were black with golden flames painted onto them in a way that you could still see some black through the paint, making it seem like the flames were almost real. His forearms were also wrapped in bandages, with his forearm guards over them, painted in the same manner as his shin guards. His metal-plated gloves were in place. The shirt he had on was form-fitting and dark orange. He wore a battle cloak like his father's, except it was black with golden flames with red tips on the bottom and on the sleeves, as well as a red fox with nine tails on the back. His necklace was under his shirt, and he wore a black mask like Kakashi's that left his eyes easily visible. He had replaced the cloth on his headband with dark red cloth, and his swords were strapped to his belt in the same way they were the previous day. Firestorm on his right and Kitsu no Akari on his left. His thigh pouch was bulging slightly, as he had packed more supplies into it than he carried around on a regular day. Thinking about his supplies, Naruto realized that he had forgotten to bring his decoy dust with him, and inwardly cursed himself. How am I going to disguise my jutsu now? Not expecting any reply, he was surprised to hear Kurama say, You'll just have to deal with the consequences one way or another, Kit. Either don't use any jutsu, or come up with an explanation for how you can manipulate the forces of nature without dust. Naruto was surprised enough that he actually stopped walking altogether. Kurama-sensei, you called me Kit. The nine-tailed Kitsune snapped back. I did no such thing, brat. Don't you have some place you need to be? Naruto laughed at the Kitsune's reaction and continued walking with a smile on his face. When he arrived at the cliffside, Ashbin and Goodwitch were already there. Goodwitch's eyes widened at his appearance, and Ashbin raised an eyebrow as he took a sip from his coffee mug. Well then, Mr. Uzumaki, I see you're ready early. That's a new look, Ashbin commented. Naruto chuckled and pulled his mask down to be polite. This is what I usually wear for battle when I'm prepared. Goodwitch raised an eyebrow. You seemed plenty prepared when you aided Miss Rose a week ago. Naruto shook his head. I didn't have even half of my weapons with me then. Just a few can I. Today, I'm bringing out the big guns. Well, metaphorically speaking at least. He gestured to his two swords. Ashbin looked at the swords with interest. Given what you can accomplish with one of your knives, I have to wonder what you can do with one of those. A mischievous smile spread onto Naruto's face. I'm sure you'll see what Firestorm and Kitsune no Akari are capable of in good time. Just then, the other students began to arrive, and everyone took a spot on a launch pad. Naruto replaced his mask as soon as he saw the first few students coming. Once all of the students were on their podiums, Ashbin began to speak. For years, you have trained to become warriors, and today your abilities will be evaluated in the Emerald Forest. He looked towards Goodwitch, who picked up the explanation where he left off. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard rumors about the assignment of teams. Well, allow us to put an end to your confusion. Each of you will be given teammates. Today, Ashbin resumed speaking. These teammates will be with you for the rest of your time here at Beacon, so it is in your best interest to be paired with someone with whom you can work well. That being said, the first person you make eye contact with after landing will be your partner for the next four years. From far off to his right, Naruto could hear a voice he recognized as Red's cry out a slightly distraught, What? Ashbin ignored the outburst and continued, After you've partnered up, make your way to the northern end of the forest. You will meet opposition along the way. Do not hesitate to destroy everything in your path, or you will die. A white-haired teacher preaching the come at me with intent to kill lesson? Naruto couldn't help himself. He burst out laughing and said, Roger that, Kakashi-sensei. Everyone looked at him like he was crazy, and Ashbin looked at him with curiosity in his gaze. You will be monitored and graded for the duration of your initiation, but our instructors will not intervene. You will find an abandoned temple at the end of the path containing several relics. Each pair will choose one and return to the top of the cliff. We will regard that item, as well as your standing, and grade you appropriately. Are there any questions? Ignoring the raised hand of some blonde scraggly kid in front of him, Ashbin said, Good. Now, take your positions. 
As the blonde student began to say something, Naruto was launched into the air, followed by the rest of the students one after the other. As Naruto flew through the air, he heard a bird call behind him that was suddenly silenced, and he heard Red's voice cry out, Birdie? No. He chuckled to himself as he began to get closer to the trees. He pulled out two kanai with ninja wire tied to the rings and threw them at a tree in front of him and off to his left a bit. When the kanai stuck into the tree, Naruto wrapped the ninja wires around his left hand. When the string ran out of slack, Naruto began to wind around the tree, slowing down as the ninja wire wrapped more and more around the tree. Once he had slowed to a safe speed, he let go of the wire and began tree hopping to get some distance towards the forest temple. He continued in this manner for about 10 seconds before a branch snapped under his weight and he tucked and rolled to a stop on the ground. As he was cursing the more powerful gravity of this world for making tree hopping more difficult, he heard the sound of something approaching from behind him. It was moving fast, faster than even he could go without pumping nearly all of his chakra into his legs. He turned towards the source of the noise, just in time to see Red skidding to a stop in front of him. Their eyes locked onto each other for a few seconds before Naruto smiled and said, Well, hello there. Nice to see you again, Red. Although he had avoided going to meet her before, he figured that she would make a good partner if her performance outside of the dust shop was any indication. Red crossed her arms with a huff. My name's not Red. It's Ruby. And what do you mean it's nice to see me again? We've never met before? She stared at him for a few seconds before her eyes widened and lit up with recognition. Oh my god, it's you. You were that guy who fought Torchwick with me. Naruto nodded and slid his mask down to his neck. Yeah, that was me. I'm Uzumaki Naruto. Ruby started shaking with excitement, nearly hopping up and down in place. I'm Ruby. Ruby Rose. It's so great to actually meet you. I mean, we were fighting Torchwick and that lady, and then you just came out of nowhere and started spitting fire. That was so cool. And then the stuff with the lightning and disappearing afterwards. You were like a ninja. Naruto sighed. His partner was like an eight-year-old. But for some reason, he couldn't help but smile, her hyperactivity reminding him of how he used to be. Well, that makes sense, seeing as I am a ninja. Now chill out so we can get to the temple as soon as possible. We can't afford to be slowed down at all. He replaced his mask and turned north, only to have Ruby zip to a few inches in front of him her hands curled in front of her chest like paws and making a paddling motion. Don't worry. I'm not slow. Let's get going. With that, she took off ahead, and Naruto scrambled to try and catch up. After a few seconds, he stopped in a clearing to get his bearings, mumbling to himself about stupid teammates who didn't know how to stick together. Suddenly, he heard growling and smelled darkness around him. He took a stance, hand loosely curled around the hilt of Kitsu no Akari, and looked around him. Out of the bushes came a small pack of Bia wolves. Naruto let his hand drop from the hilt of his sword and chuckled. Well, I've been itching for a good fight. You guys would be too easy if I drew my sword, though. Let's see. Ooh, I haven't practiced the Rasengan in a while. What do you guys say? You want to be my test dummies? Naruto faced towards the largest one, probably the Alpha, and began gathering chakra to his palm. He charged towards the Beowulf, completing the Rasengan on the way, but just as he was about to strike, Ruby came out of nowhere and dealt a small wound to the beast's chest with her scythe. Naruto's eyes became wide with shock and fear. He barely had enough time to react and managed to leap over Ruby and slam the now incomplete Rasengan into the beast's head. The kick from the Rasengan drove the beast to the ground, and Ruby finished it off by decapitating it. Naruto put his anger with the girl on the back burner for the moment, as they had more grim to deal with. Standing side by side, the two looked at the small ring of Grimm closing in. Ruby planted the tip of her scythe in the ground and fired a few shots, killing two Bia wolves and injuring one, while Naruto pulled out Kitsu no Akari, coated it in wind chakra, and decapitated a Beowulf that had charged at them. As Ruby rushed forward to kill the injured Beowulf with her scythe, Naruto sliced a second Beowulf in half at the waist after dodging a swipe from its claws, then finished off the last Beowulf by stunning it with a Sandabruto no Jutsu, Thunderbolt Jutsu channeled through his sword then closing in to stab it through the chest. A few seconds after he finished, Ruby felled the Beowulf she had injured before and turned to see Naruto walking up to her, sheathing his sword. She smiled at him and said, That was awesome. We really showed those Beowulves how it's done. Her celebration was cut off when she saw the fury in Naruto's eyes. He nearly ripped his mask off of his face and shouted, What the hell were you thinking back there? Ruby withered under his gaze. I don't... What are you talking about? just taking off without me with no set rendezvous point. 
jumping in front of me as I was about to attack that Beowulf. Do you have any sense of strategy? Have you ever worked with a team before? I was about half an inch from killing you. Naruto began panting, the rage fueled by panic after almost killing his partner leaving him. So soon after his first kill, the thought of accidentally killing anyone else, let alone his partner, shook him up a fair amount. Ruby had tears in her eyes that looked ready to spill over at any second. She had shrunk into herself at Naruto's shouting, I'm sorry. Naruto immediately felt guilty for putting her in this state. He sighed and said, It's all right. I'm sorry too. I didn't mean to yell at you. It's just, I really almost killed you, and it scared the crap out of me. Ruby recovered a little, stowing her weapon away. Would, would that attack have really killed me? I mean, all it did was knock that Beowulf down, and I have my aura unlocked, so I can shield myself a bit. Naruto looked at her and said, When I saw you jump in front of me, I was so afraid that I was going to hurt you. So focused on diverting my attack, I lost concentration and my rasengan was weakened. If you had popped up just a second later, you would have been hit with this. He then walked up to a thick tree, formed a rasengan, and slammed it into the bark. It ground into the tree and then exploded, blasting all the way through the trunk and causing the top half of the tree to fall into the clearing. Ruby's eyes were wide, seeing the fate that she had almost brought upon herself. Oh my god. Naruto walked up to her and replaced his mask. Let's just leave this little incident behind us, okay? Let's learn from it, but let's get off to a new start. Sound good? Ruby nodded. Right. Lesson learned. Stay together and don't be in front of attacking teammates. She wiped the last of the tears from her eyes and put a smile on her face. Naruto smiled under his mask. Good. We'll get to team tactics eventually, but for now, we've got a temple to raid. With that, he began to run to the north, making sure Ruby was keeping pace with him before beginning to pump a small amount of chakra into his legs. As Ruby pulled up alongside him, she said, You're pretty fast too. Naruto chuckled and said, Thanks. From what I saw from the air, the temple should be in this direction. How long can you keep this pace up? Ruby contemplated for a moment before saying, I'm not sure. I've never really tried to push my limits for endurance. Naruto nodded. All right, let's keep up this pace for a little while longer, then start walking for a while. We made quite the ruckus back in that clearing, and I'd like to put some distance between it and us before relaxing at all. They ran for a few more minutes before Naruto figured that they had gotten enough distance from the clearing and called a halt. Ruby decided to climb a tree to see if they could see the temple from their position, and Naruto followed her upwards to get a look around as well. Thankfully, they were actually at the top of a hill at the time, so they could see even farther than they would normally be able to. They saw a clearing a few miles away that looked like it had a structure of some sort at the center, and they immediately set off for it. After about an hour of walking, they saw the temple through the trees and picked up their pace. As they arrived, they saw two other figures looking at some pedestals that had small black or gold objects on them. Ruby immediately became excited, and with a shout of Yang, she took off to give the mini Tsunade a hug. Naruto followed behind at a more leisurely pace, giving time for the two sisters to talk for a little bit. He idly noted that the blonde girl's partner was the black-haired girl with the bow that he thought he had known from somewhere. As he stepped into the rundown temple, he heard Yang say, So, sis, who's your partner? Naruto reached out a hand and said, Uzumaki Naruto. She shook his hand and said, Yang Shaolong. Naruto looked over at the girl with the bow. She smiled and said, Blake. Ruby decided to add her input. This is the guy I was telling you about, sis. He's the one who saved me while I was battling Torchwick's men. She turned to Naruto with a sheepish gaze. I never actually thanked you for that. Thanks. Yang looked at Naruto with wide eyes. You're the one who saved my sister's life? You have my thanks as well? Naruto removed his mask again and smiled. You're welcome. I was just glad I could help. Young then asked, So can you really spit fireballs? Or was Ruby just exaggerating? Blake's eyes widened at this comment, and Ruby looked indignant. Of course he can. He was all like Batten. I'll sink you with no shoes. And then he spat fireballs out. She looked at Naruto with a confused expression. Why did you say that anyway? It was just a bunch of nonsense. Naruto laughed and said, No, that's not what I said. I said Katon, Hosenka no Jutsu. He slowly and clearly enunciated the Jutsu name. Blake's voice was suddenly heard. Fire release? Art of the Phoenix Flower? Naruto looked at her in shock. Yeah, that's the name of the technique. How do you know Japanese? Blake raised an eyebrow. The usual way. I learned it. Although a better question is why would you call out the names of your attacks? 
and why in a dead language? Ruby and Yang were looking back and forth between Blake and Naruto. The latter shrugged. Calling out the name of the technique helps my focus, and Japanese was actually my first language. All three were looking at him with curiosity now, obviously wondering why he would have a dead language as his native tongue. Before they could say anything else, Naruto said, I think that's enough time spent socializing. We should get our relics and head back to the cliffs. It's going to be a long trek back. Ruby shook her head. Actually, there's a place we can get back up the cliffs just a mile from here or so. I saw it when we were up in the tree. Naruto realized that she was right. The headmaster never said that they had to return to the starting point. They just had to get back to the top of the cliffs. Yang and Ruby each took a golden horse figurine, and just as they were about to leave, they heard yelling and then the blonde scraggly guy with the sword came flying out of nowhere and hit a tree, getting caught in the branches. Ruby called out, John. But before she could climb up to help him, there was a commotion at the edge of the clearing, and an Ursa came thundering in with Nora riding on its back. After she broke it and was briefly scolded by Rian, she rushed up to the temple to take one of the golden figurines that was shaped like a tower. As Ruby reached John and began to help him free from the branches, a nevermore flew overhead, and two figures jumped from its claws. Or rather, one figure jumped and grabbed onto the other figure, causing them both to fall. But before anyone could try to help them, they inexplicably stopped accelerating downward and floated gently down. As the two airborne figures got closer to the temple, they could see and hear Wei Shni screaming and yelling at Charles Ebony, who had the heiress in his arms. The two landed safely just in time to see another figure running into the clearing. She had long red hair and was dressed in bronze armor. She carried a spear and was being chased by a huge death stalker. As everyone else gathered around the temple, the girl was knocked into their group, landing on John and knocking him over. Yang smiled and sarcastically said, Great, the gang's all here. Now we can die together. Ruby smirked back at her and said, Not if I can help it. Naruto, if I make an opening for you on that Deathstalker, can you nail it with that orb thingy? Naruto nodded. Rasengan combo take two is a go. Just make sure you get clear this time. She nodded, and they charged. Naruto already molding chakra in his right palm, and Ruby using her semblance to get ahead of him and give her some room to dodge. Yang began to run after them with a cry of, Ruby, wait. Ruby, however, did not wait and smashed her scythe into the Death Stalker. Unfortunately, it blocked with its pincer, but Ruby rolled to the side and struck it again. While it was distracted trying to hit Ruby, Naruto jumped into the air. With a yell of Rasengan, Naruto drove the swirling ball of energy into the armored back of the giant scorpion. Unfortunately, it appeared that the bone armor of the Grimms was incredibly durable and only allowed the Rasengan to grind into it very slowly. With a roar of pain, the Death Stalker thrashed around, throwing Naruto off as he detonated the Rasengan on the Death Stalker's back. There was a spurt of blood, and the armor plating was deeply scratched in a spiral pattern, but the beast's injuries were only minor. As Naruto began to prepare a second attack, the trees behind him were snapped over as a giant snake barreled its way into the clearing and struck at Naruto. He rolled to the side and sliced the eye of the Taijutu with Firestorm. He was not prepared, however for its tail to circle around and smack him in the back, knocking him into the mouth of the monster. With a lunging motion, it swallowed him whole. Naruto. No. Ruby was so distraught at seeing her partner get eaten that she didn't notice that the Death Stalker had reared its tail back to strike at her. Yang, who had just reached the battleground, tackled her out of the way, and the giant stinger was lodged into the ground. Weiss, seeing an opportunity, rushed forward and used a dust spell to freeze the Deathstalker's tail in place before it could get free. The others were all occupied with dodging feathers that the Nevermore had rained down upon them while those with ranged weapons were firing shots at it, trying to do whatever damage they could. Ruby had tears streaming down her face, and she was choking back sobs. Her partner had just been killed in the process of following one of her plans, and she would never forgive herself. She and Yang got up and turned to face the snake, which had turned its gaze to them. Yang snarled at it. I'm going to make that thing pay. For Naruto. She charged at the snake. But before she could even fire a shot with Ember Celica, it fell to the ground and started writhing. Suddenly, its side exploded open, showering Ruby, Weiss, and Yang with guts and flesh. Out of the large hole in the now-dead Grimm walked a very angry Naruto. Why the absolute heck does every snake I ever meet try to eat me? Ruby's eyes were wide as she covered her mouth with her hand her virgin ears reeling from Naruto's cursing. 
but she quickly recovered and used all of her speed to catch the slimy ninja in a massive hug. She didn't notice him freeze up upon being enveloped by the hug, as she was too exuberant. You're alive. You're alive. Tears streamed down her face again, this time in relief, but after a few seconds, the slimy feeling caught up with her excitement at seeing her partner alive, and she jumped back from him and began trying to shake the slime off of herself. E.W. Gross, 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 gross. Ruby's reaction snapped Naruto out of his frozen posture, and he chuckled and coated his body in chakra, which he then used to force most of the blood and slime to slide off of him. Nice to see you too. Everyone gathered at the temple again, and John commented, That bird thing is circling back? Weiss looked around and said, There's no point in dilly-dallying. Our objective is right in front of us. Let's just take our relics and leave. Ruby nodded. She's right. There's no point in fighting these guys. Jun Smiled. Run and live. That is an idea I can get behind. The teams who didn't have relics quickly grabbed the closest pieces, John getting a golden rook and Weiss grabbing a golden bishop. Then everyone began heading northwest to the nearest cliffside at a swift pace. As they left, the Death Stalker began to break free, and a few Ursi wandered out of the woods behind it, drawn to the temple by the noise and smell of blood. As they began their run to the cliffs, Yang and Ruby fell into stride beside Naruto, with Blake on Yang's other side. Yang glanced over at Naruto and said, You know, the way you reacted when you popped that Taijadu makes it seem like that's happened before. Naruto chuckled and replied, This is the third time I've been swallowed whole by a giant snake. I've got a standard operating procedure for it at this point. In fact, I've killed more snakes now from the inside than the outside. The three girls gaped at him for a moment before deciding that there was a better time and place for this discussion. The group of ten prospective students made their way toward a set of ruins built over a deep canyon that was up against the cliffs. It was connected to both the cliffs and the other side of the canyon by two stone bridges. As they moved out of the cover of the trees, the nevermore from before began to fly overhead. Everyone quickly took cover behind the pillars that led up to the ruins and watched as the nevermore landed on the skeleton of the tower up ahead of them. Yang commented, Well, that's great. Before they had time to formulate a plan, the trees were broken behind them, and the Deathstalker came lumbering out, followed by two Ursi. John turned and said, A oh, man! Everybody run! Everyone broke cover as the Nevermore began to rain feathers down at them, and Rian yelled, Nora! Distracted! She complied happily, launching grenade after pink grenade at the monstrous bird as it took off from the ruins, dodging feathers as she went. She even managed to score a few direct hits. The Deathstalker and one of the Ursi came up behind her, but they were attacked by Blake, Rayon, and Charles while Weiss used her glyphs to pull Nora to safety. The five of them started running for the bridge, and Pira dropped to a knee to give them covering fire while they retreated. As they began to cross the bridge, disaster struck. The Nevermore had circled back around and rammed into part of the bridge, causing it to collapse. Ran, Blake, Pira, Charles, and Weiss were on the side connected to the mainland and were backed into a metaphorical corner by the Deathstalker and the two Ursi. The Ursi were behind the Deathstalker, so when Weiss used her glyphs to propel herself and Charles over the Deathstalker to outflank it, they had to defend themselves instead of relieving pressure from the others as they had intended. Meanwhile, Blake had begun to slash at the Deathstalker with her ribbon knife as Ran and Pira pelted it with gunfire. Ruby was firing at the Nevermore, and Naruto drew Firestorm to add to the barrage. John watched as Blake was knocked back by the Deathstalker, and three Bio Wolves ran out of the trees replacing the Ursa that Weiss had managed to kill with a fire glyph. Man, we gotta get over there. They need help. Nora hefted Magnhild and said, Let's do this. John looked at the drop below them nervously and said, Yeah, but, uh, I can't make that jump. He regretted those words as Nora smiled evilly, knocked him backward with Magnhild before shifting it to hammer form, and used said form to launch the both of them over to the other side. Nora was quick to smash the Deathstalker's head with her hammer, but was knocked back into Blake, who was knocked off of the edge of the bridge. The black-clad girl, seeing the Nevermore above her, fired the pistol form of Gamble, shroud into the side of a pillar, and swung up using its ribbon to get in front of the Nevermore. Using her semblance, she flickered up onto its head and began landing blows on it as she ran down its spine. Reaching its tail, she jumped off and landed on the top of a broken wall before jumping down to land next to Yong, Naruto, and Ruby. It's tougher than it looks she warned her companions, to which Yang responded, then let's hit it with everything we've got. The four began firing their weapons at it, but it didn't seem to deter it. 
It smashed the tower underneath them, causing the tower to collapse and forcing them to use the falling debris as stepping stones to get to stable ground. Naruto snarled and said, This doesn't appear to be working. Ruby turned towards him and said, Do you have any other kind of magic fireballs that might be able to hurt it? Naruto clenched his fists. My techniques don't do as much damage to these things as they do to most things. Rasengan should have killed that Death Stalker. I'd need something very powerful to do any damage to. He trailed off as he remembered the technique he had been working on. Ruby moved closer as Naruto fell silent. What is it? Do you have something? He nodded. I could use my new technique. I've never used it in battle before, but it would kill that thing for sure. But it takes nearly a whole minute to charge up and unleash. Ruby's eyes widened. That's a long time in a battle. Let's get with the others and form a plan to distract that thing then. Naruto nodded and the two jumped over to confer with Blake and Yang. As this was happening, the Death Stalker had weakened the bridge underneath John, Pira, Ran, and Nora, forcing them to charge it to try and get on solid ground. Pira and John deflected the pincers of the beast with their shields and struck blows at it with their weapons, while Ran grabbed a hold of the beast's stinger and fired countless rounds into the weak joint above the gold-colored appendage. As he did this, Nora fired grenades at the Death Stalker's face and Pira threw her spear into its eye. The enraged beast flung Ran into a distant pillar, but the damage had been done. Seeing the stinger was loose, John called out, Pira, and gestured to the stinger. She replied, Done, and flung her shield, severing the stinger, which fell and impaled the beast through the wound that Naruto had dealt to it earlier. John saw the opportunity for what it was and said, Nora, nail it. She hefted her hammer and with a cry of, Heads up, jumped onto Pira's shield, which had returned to her after bouncing off of a pillar. She was flung into the air by the girl, aided by the recoil of Magnhild, and fell down towards the Death Stalker. She smashed the back of the stinger with Magnhild as Pira and John jumped over the Death Stalker to safety, Pira retrieving her spear along the way. Ran was being attended to by Weiss, who was forming a low-powered healing glyph, while Charles finished off the last of the Bio Wolves. As they all gathered at the edge of the canyon, exhausted, they turned to witness the rest of the battle between the others and the Nevermore. Naruto had just leapt up to the top of a pillar, while Ruby, Yong, and Blake were distracting the bird with copious amounts of gunfire. The Nevermore had circled just a bit too close to Blake for its own good, and she flashed onto its back with her semblance. She struck at its wing joints with gamble shroud and katana form, but it only managed to snap a few feathers off before she was forced to jump off of the beast as it spun around to shake her off. Then, Naruto began to weave hand seals as a golden aura surrounded him. The others could hear an ethereal chanting coming from him. Nora couldn't help wondering aloud, What is he doing? Ren's eyes had gone wide as he remembered something. There was an incident last week where an unidentified youth entered an ongoing battle between a huntress and the crime boss Roman Torchwick. The reports said that he called upon nature's wrath, but without using dust. The others stared at Ren wide-eyed as he continued. Instead, he rapidly made strange hand gestures. Apparently, he launched a massive barrage of fireballs with only six of these gestures. I get the feeling that Naruto is that unidentified combatant. And if six of those gestures equal a barrage of fireballs, he trailed off, but the others had come to the same conclusion. Whatever Naruto was doing, it would be big. Yang, Ruby, and Blake lowered their weapons, staring at the giant fire dragon in awe. The others were in a similar position already. Saru. Inu, Hitsuchi, Torai, Saru, Hitsuchi, Tora, Tetsu, I, Torai, Hitsuchi, Ne, Inu, Saru. The Nevermore struggled against the coils of the dragon, but the flames did not budge. Inu, Hitsuji, Tori, Saru, Hitsuji, Tora, Tatsu, I, Tori. Thun, Katheridan no Yatsu. Wind Dragon Bullet Jutsu. Naruto kept his hands in the last seal that they had formed and the wind swirled around him to form a second dragon of the same proportions that flew in the exact opposite direction from the Nevermore before turning around and flying straight at the trapped Grim. Just before the wind dragon impacted, Naruto shouted, Kambijutsu, Asahi no Ryu, Collaboration Jutsu, Rising Sun Dragons? The wind dragon struck the fire dragon at an incredible speed, and everyone was forced to avert their eyes as the resulting explosion shone as bright as the sun for a few brief moments. When they could look again, the cliffside was alight with golden fire in many places, and all that was left of the Nevermore was a pile of smoldering ash. In his mind Naruto heard Kurama say, 
Congratulations on your first successful original Jutsu kit. Naruto was too exhausted to even register the fact that QB had called him Kit for the second time that day. The golden aura around him faded, and he felt himself beginning to lose his balance. He had successfully mixed most of his aura and chi back into chakra to overcharge the Jutsu, but it had cost him. Back on the ground, Charles summed up what everyone was thinking with two words. Holy shit. Ruby and Young gave a huge cheer after recovering from the shock, but their celebration was cut short as they heard Blake's distressed cry of, Naruto. They turned to see their ally fall from the pillar, headed downward toward what was left of the bridge. The three of them rushed over to the black-cloaked blonde, who managed to tuck and roll as he hit the bridge, minimizing the damage done. When they got to him, he was laying on his back, eyes closed and panting. Sweat coated his face. Ruby knelt next to her partner and lifted his head off of the hard stone and into the crook of her arm, pulling his mask off to help him breathe easier. Naruto, can you hear me? Are you alright? I'm fine. Ruby just exhausted, ah? His words were separated by his gasps for air. Naruto knew that he could have averted this level of absolute exhaustion by shifting into his Hanyu form before performing the two jutsu. He also knew that his current state could be alleviated by transforming, but it would raise too many questions if he suddenly had fox ears and two tails. Help me up? Ruby nodded and with Yang's help, dragged Naruto to his feet, one of his arms around each of them. His eyes eased open just in time to see the rest of their little group make their way over to their position. Weiss was the first one to arrive. How in the world did you do that? I've never seen anything like it, even with dust spells. Dragons made up of forces of nature. Naruto had begun to catch his breath. Long story. Crazy teachers. Lots of practice. Very exhausting. However, this didn't seem to appease Weiss. But surely more people would be able to do things like that if they only required teaching and practice. Is it your semblance that lets you do things like that? Seeing the opportunity to cover for his lack of dust, Naruto nodded. Yeah, we can. Talk more later. He tried to remove his arms from Yang and Ruby's shoulders, but they held onto his hands, preventing him from doing so. Yang scolded him. Oh no you don't, whiskers. You'll just keel right over in your condition. But we need to get to the top of the cliffs. You can't carry me when we're climbing. Now you listen here, Naruto, Ruby said. You are not going anywhere until you've rested. Naruto looked at her imploringly. More grim might come. We need to leave. Ruby shook her head. Absolutely not. If any more grim come, I'll take care of them. You're my partner, and I won't let you get yourself hurt. Yang looked at her sister. You won't have to do it alone, sis. I'll stay here until you're ready to go as well. Blake nodded. As will I. John stepped forward. I'll watch your back too. Pira stepped forward to stand next to John. And I will as well. Nora swung her hammer a few times. If any grim come for you, I'll smash their faces in. Rain smiled the hair antics. And I'll make sure Nora doesn't accidentally blow you up. As Nora huffed indignantly, Charles smiled and said, I'll stick around too. I might see something else that blows my mind. Weiss looked like she wanted to argue with her partner, but then shrugged and said, I guess I'll stay as well. Naruto wasn't able to speak for several seconds, too overcome by emotion. This is what comrades should be like. He smiled a genuine smile then, and said, Thank you, all of you. Ruby and Yang moved him over to a pillar and set him down so that he could lean against it. As they all sat down to catch whatever rest they could, he heard Ruby ask from her spot beside him, so what other stuff can you do, aside from making exploding orbs and summoning dragons? Naruto thought for a moment before saying, Well, I'm learning to do a similar dragon technique with lightning, but I haven't quite got the hang of it. The main three elements I can manipulate are fire, wind, and lightning, but I'm not as good with lightning as I am with the other two. I can do some small things with earth, but I haven't practiced them much. You've already seen the Rasengan. That's about it. That was my ultimate technique you just saw. It really shouldn't be possible for me to do something like that until I'm older, even among people who can do things like that. I have a bit of a special condition. Even so, it exhausted me more than I thought it would. If I tried to use any of my other major techniques at the moment, I'd probably die. Everyone's eyes widened, and Ruby asked with horror in her voice. You mean those techniques could kill you? Naruto nodded. Yeah, is that a surprise to you? Pira commented, yes. We've always been taught that you can't be killed just by using up too much aura. The worst that can happen is you go into a coma for a few days from aura exhaustion. Where in the world did you learn how to use attacks like that? 
Naruto looked down at his knees for a few seconds. They were taught to me by a few teachers. One of them was the best teacher I've ever had. The other two. They were okay. I guess. Rin furrowed his eyebrows. It seems irresponsible to me for a teacher to be instructing someone our age how to use skills that could potentially kill the user. Naruto laughed. Well, one of them did throw me off a cliff to force me to access my inner power. So you might be right. He looked up to see horrified expressions looking back at him. Oh, chill out. It worked, which is why I'm here to talk to you. Yang looked at him as if he was crazy. Right. Remind me to never accept lessons from your so-called teachers. After a few seconds of silence, Weiss decided to question her partner. You never did tell me how you managed to float us down from the Nevermore. What exactly is your semblance? Charles shrugged and said, I can manipulate gravity in an area close to me. It's pretty useless in combat, but good for not dying from falls. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this. Can you make things heavier as well? Charles nodded. Yeah, but I don't see how that could help. Naruto face bombed. Crush Grim under heavy gravity. Throw them off balance by making half of them lighter. Jump higher under less gravity to avoid attacks. Come on, Charles. You've got to be creative with your semblance. Charles was a bit shocked at all of the possibilities he hadn't considered. I never thought of. How is it that in like 20 seconds you think of all of these things, but in three years I haven't? Naruto shrugged. I've learned to be able to think on my feet when combat abilities are involved. At that point, Naruto figured that they had been resting for long enough. Well, I'm good to go. Let's climb a cliff, shall we? He then got up, but had to stand still for a moment as his head swam. The others stood up from their resting positions. Ruby looked at him with concern. Are you sure? We can rest a bit longer. Naruto nodded. I'll be fine. We've been out here long enough as it is. They all made their way to the cliffs and began to climb. Several of them used their weapons to cut handholds into the rock. Naruto almost fell a few times, but Ruby was always there to reach out a hand to steady him. He thanked her with a grateful smile each time. Once he was halfway up the cliffside, he tried channeling a little bit of chakra to his feet and found that it was harder than usual, but still well within his ability to do so. He took inventory of his chakra levels and estimated that he had enough spare chakra to surface walk the rest of the way up. When Naruto stopped climbing for several seconds, Ruby became concerned. Naruto? Are you alright? Naruto looked at her and smiled. Yup. I'm fine. In fact, I'm well enough to get us both to the top of this cliff. Ruby's eyes widened. You don't mean with one of your techniques, do you? Naruto nodded. Ruby gave him her most stern look which just made her seem cute more than anything else, and said, Naruto, I will not allow you to hurt yourself just to EP. Her lecture was cut off by Naruto, suddenly letting go of the cliffside and scooping her up in his arms. He was standing horizontally on the cliffside, feet glowing a slight blue. Hold on, he said before beginning to run straight up the cliffside. Everyone else watched with a mixture of worry and amusement as Ruby and Naruto passed all of them and made it to the top of the cliff. Once they had made it to the top, Naruto gently set down a blushing ruby and sat down to rest. See? We're both fine. I know my limits. Ruby recovered from her blushing and said, Thanks. That was actually really fun. Her blush re-emerged, but wasn't noticed by an oblivious Naruto. He was busy looking back at the cliff's edge. You know, I could go and help? His suggestion was cut off by Ruby, who grabbed his shoulders from behind and kept him in his sitting position. Oh no you don't. You're going to stay right here so you don't hurt yourself. Naruto reluctantly agreed, and the two partners sat and waited for everyone else to reach the top. Russell Thrush, Cardin Winchester, Dove Bronzewing, and Skylark. Everyone was at the assembly for the announcement of the teams, and Naruto had recovered about a fourth of his chakra, which meant that he no longer showed any signs of his complete exhaustion. After all of their little group had made it up the cliff, an airship had come to pick them all up. They had been given time to clean up and then gathered back in the auditorium, where they were now. You retrieved the Black Bishop pieces. From this day forward you will work together as Team CRDL, led by Cardin Winchester. The four men left the stage area, as Weiss, Charles, and two others walked up to the stage. One of the two wore dark blue pants and a shirt of a matching color that had black trim. She had a breastplate with a stylized wave design on it, as well as a forearm guard on her left arm that had a plate of armor on the inside of her arm. The reason for this was the very large bow and matching quiver strapped to her back. She also had a golden belt that had several large pouches hanging from it. Her platinum blonde hair was tied up in a bun, and her eyes were a dark blue, slightly violet color. The other was a wolf faunus, 
His gray ears and tail displayed proudly. His gaze was intense, as if daring anyone to try and discriminate against him. He had several short hunting knives strapped to him in various places, and a pistol on each hip. He wore a short-sleeved black shirt with a gray wolf head on the front and black, gray, and white camouflage pattern pants. He had a green headband on that held back his black hair from falling into his eyes, which were yellow and wolf-like, for obvious reasons. Why Shni, Charles Ebony, Indigoanda, and Timber Gray. Naruto's eyes widened as Ashbin announced the last name. Could he be related to Aaron? The four of you retrieve the white bishop pieces. From this day forward, you will work together as Team White, led by Waishni. The heiress looked slightly smug, and the four of them left the stage to be replaced by John, Pira, Ran, and Nora. John Ark, Lyren, Pira Nikos, and Nora Valkyrie. The four of you retrieve the white rook pieces. From this day forward, you will work together as Team JNPR, led by John Ark. John was completely flabbergasted, and Pira's friendly punch knocked him over. His teammates helped him up, and they left the stage to be replaced by Ruby, Naruto, Blake, and Yang. And finally, Blake Belladonna, Ruby Rose, Uzumaki Naruto, and Yang Xiao Long. The four of you retrieve the White Knight pieces. From this day forward, you will work together as Team Ruby, led by Ruby Rose. Yang immediately trapped her sister in a bear hug. I'm so proud of you. As the ceremony closed, Ashpin commented, It looks like things are shaping up to be an interesting year. He seemed to be looking directly at Naruto when he said this. After the ceremony was over, Team Ruby headed right back to the dorms and got ready for bed as quickly as possible. They were all exhausted from the events of the day, Naruto in particular. As soon as he was in his sleepwear, he crawled under the covers and was out like a light. The next morning, Naruto woke up to the sound of a loud whistle. He leapt out of bed and onto the ceiling, landing in a crouch and instinctively reaching for a kanai from his thigh pouch, which wasn't there at the moment. He relaxed slightly when he remembered where he was. Ruby, Blake, and Yang were all already up and in uniform, and were looking at their teammate with more than a little surprise as he hung above their heads with a grumpy expression on his face. Ruby, he said with an irritated look, I assume you have a good reason for using a whistle to wake me up? Ruby looked sheepish. Um, we need to unpack and decorate the room? Naruto sighed and dropped down from the ceiling, landing on his feet with ease. Was it really better than just poking me or something? Ruby didn't have an answer to that, and Naruto went into the bathroom that their dorm room came equipped with to change into his uniform. When he came back into the room, his teammates had already begun arranging their possessions, and he joined them. By the time they were finished decorating, the four beds had become piled up in the center of the room. Naruto looked at the beds and said, Well, this isn't going to work. We'll need to ditch some of our stuff. Ruby crossed her arms. Or we could just ditch the beds and replace them with bunk beds. It would be pretty efficient commented Blake. Fifteen minutes later, one bed was suspended from the ceiling with ropes, and another was balanced on top of the post of the one below it, with some books to increase the amount of space for the lower bunk. Naruto looked at the setup skeptically. This looks like it's going to end up killing someone. Kurama chuckled evilly. Just consider it a form of training. You'll have to be constantly on guard for danger. Or aren't you shinobi enough for it? Naruto nearly growled out loud at Kurama's insinuation, and Yang punched his shoulder lightly. Don't be such a worrywart, Whiskers. Ruby smiled and said, All right, mission accomplished. Now for the next order of business. Her face fell, and her voice lost its enthusiasm. Classes. Okay, we have a few classes together. At nine o'clock we have Grim Studies Dash. She was cut off by Naruto. I hate to end your briefing prematurely, fearless leader, but the class you just mentioned starts in seven minutes. She was silent for a moment before raising a fist in the air and saying, To class. She burst out the door, followed by the rest of Team Ruby as well as Team JNPR, who had been reminded of the class by all of the shouting from Ruby, and they ran with all haste toward the Grim Studies classroom. When they arrived, they noticed that Team White also had the same Grim Studies class with them. In fact, it looked like all of the first-year students were in the class. It was probably a standard course for everyone. Ruby ended up sitting next to Weiss on her right, and Naruto on her left. Yang and Blake sat farther to her left, and Team JNPR was in the row behind them. The professor, a rotund man with an incredibly bushy mustache, began his lecture. Monsters, demons, prowlers of the night. Yes, the creatures of Grimm have many names, but I merely refer to them as prey. Ah. Professor Port's loud laugh snapped Ruby out of her nap with a slight outcry, which earned her a dirty glare from Weiss and an amused look from Naruto. 
After getting no laughs from the class, the professor continued the lecture. Ah, uh, and you shall too upon graduating from this prestigious academy. Now as I was saying, Vale, as well as the other three kingdoms, are safe havens in an otherwise treacherous world. Our planet is absolutely teeming with creatures that would love nothing more than to tear you to pieces. And that's where we come in. Huntsmen. Huntresses. He then winked at Yang, who looked like she wanted to vomit. Karama snorted. Foolish Nin Jin. He cares more for posturing and bragging than getting anything accomplished. Naruto silently agreed with his sensei and began to copy the drawings and labels of the various species of Grimm on the wall behind Professor Port instead of taking notes on the lecture itself. Meanwhile, Ruby was also putting her pencil and paper to use as Professor Port began to tell a useless anecdote about him fighting a Beowulf. Naruto was at first surprised that she would be taking notes so studiously on such a useless lecture. He then looked at what she was writing to see if she was also copying the diagrams behind Port, only to be forced to stifle his laughter at an unflattering caricature of the professor. Weiss looked at Ruby with disdain and disapproval upon seeing the picture, and her expression became haughty as Professor Port began to list the characteristics that he said a true hunter must embody. It was obvious that she thought herself to be a better huntress than those around her. That expression reminded Naruto of Sasuke. It was the expression of someone who thought themselves superior to all others. Naruto's face adopted a look of disdain and disgust as he compared Hyoheim to his old teammate. The professor's lecture ended with the question, So, who among you believes themselves to be the embodiment of all of these traits? Naruto knew that Hyoheim was going to declare herself to be a true huntress, just to show how much better she was than everyone else. He could tell by the arrogant expression on her face, so he beat her to it. Ido, professor. He looked at Naruto and said, Ah, yes, Mr. Uzumaki. Well then, step forward and face your opponent. Oh? And please limit the amount of destructive force you use in my classroom. Naruto nodded and went to retrieve his combat gear. Don't worry, professor. I can do precision as well as blowing things up. He returned quickly, wearing his battle outfit. Those who hadn't seen it in the Emerald Forest stared a little, impressed at how intimidating he could look. He stood across the room from the cage and stood in a relaxed stance, his hand resting on the hilt of Kitsu no Akari. His team yelled encouragement. Yang Shout, go Naruto. Blake said, fight well. Ruby was the most enthusiastic. Yeah, represent Team Ruby. He heard Weiss scoff at their words, and he turned and gave them a smile. Even under the mask, he was sure they could tell he was silently thanking them for their support. All right, let the match begin. With that exclamation, Professor Port used his musket axe to chop the lock off of the cage and release a Borbatusk. It charged at Naruto who remained completely still as it approached him. The students began to worry as the Grimm got closer, thinking that Naruto was going to get gored. When the Borbatusk was only a few feet away, and some of the more squeamish students were looking away or covering their eyes, a sudden clashing noise was heard, and Naruto's sword was sunk about an inch into the tusks of the beast. Everyone in the room collectively gasped, and their thoughts were on a similar track. He's fast. Indeed, the only ones who had seen his sword move were Ruby, who was used to moving at such high speeds, and Professor Port himself, who was experienced enough that he had anticipated what Naruto was going to do. As Naruto and the Borbatus grappled, Naruto thought, damn, this thing's armor is too tough to cut without pumping the blade with wind chakra, and that would cause too much collateral damage. Professor Port used the opportunity for a teaching moment. You should know, class, that out of all of the grim in our world, a Borbatusk's armor is the strongest. You'll have to try a different tactic if you want to kill it, Mr. Uzumaki. Of course. Now he starts teaching. Naruto broke the grapple by spinning to his left, yanking Kitsune no Akari out of the Grimm's tusks as he went, and kicked the Borbatusk's flank to drive it a few feet away from him. Hang in there, Naruto. As Ruby shouted her encouragement, the Borbatusk charged at Naruto again. He struck at its slightly less armored flank as he sidestepped it, scoring a small cut. He then had an idea, and a mischievous look came into his eyes. I said I'd show him precision, and so I will. Karama saw his plan and smiled in approval. A strategy worthy of a kitsune. I will enjoy the expression on the fat fool's face when you pull this off. To everyone's shock, Naruto sheathed his sword and stared at the Borbatusk as it wheeled around and charged again. They were less surprised this time when he repeated his opening move, but his sword went deeper. They all thought that he had put more strength into it, but Professor Port's eyes had gone so wide that you could actually see them. He, he struck in the exact same place. He used the previous damage he dealt and built on it. As they grappled a second time, 
Ruby yelled out, Naruto, go for its underbelly. There's no armor there. Naruto gave a nod to his team leader as he broke the second grapple by kicking the Borbatusk in the face and then slashed its snout. Enraged, the Grim charged past him, earning it another shallow cut, before it curled into a spinning ball and rolled with great speed towards Naruto. Naruto knew that he wouldn't be able to strike the same spot a third time with human eyesight, so he did something impulsive and reckless. He did a partial transformation, calling out his slit pupil eyes to better perceive the enemy. Time seemed to slow down as Naruto shifted his stance and struck. The upper halves of the Borbatusk's tusks went flying, and the beast fell on its side, unbalanced. Naruto quickly ran over and pumped fire chakra into Kitsu no Ikari. He kicked the Borbatusk onto its back and stabbed it in the stomach, his glowing blade incinerating the flesh of the beast, leaving its faceplate and armored pieces behind. The other students were in utter shock, some of them now realizing what Naruto had done as Naruto calmly walked over to the fallen tusks and picked them up for trophies before going to put his combat gear back in his locker. After he had left, Weiss turned to Ruby and said, It must be awful for someone as skilled as him to be forced to take orders from someone like you. Before Ruby could respond, the class was dismissed, and Weiss walked out of the door. She sat there stunned for a moment before getting up to follow Weiss. Naruto arrived back into the classroom just in time to see a shocked-looking Ruby moving at a faster-than-normal pace after Weiss. Naruto followed Ruby out as she caught up to Weiss, but stayed hidden in the shadows. What was that supposed to mean, Weiss? The icy girl turned, and with a haughty look, said, It means that you obviously aren't fit to lead a team. You're childish, your academic skills are obviously subpar, and I just don't see how you contribute anything to the team as a leader. It's obvious that your team shares the same sentiment as well. Naruto was looking at your foolish antics like you were something nasty stuck to the bottom of his shoe. Ashbin made a mistake making you a leader. Ruby looked crushed by her harsh words, looking at the ground as Weiss walked away. Naruto was nearly shaking with rage. Not only had Weiss insulted his team leader, which may as well have been a direct insult to him and the entire team as well, she had misinterpreted his disgust with her haughtiness as disgust toward Ruby. Before he could go and comfort the poor girl, Ashbin himself walked up to her and began speaking to her. Naruto decided to confront Weiss about what she had said while Ruby was still occupied. Channeling a little more Kitsune Chakra, he enhanced his sense of smell enough to allow him to track Weiss. Kurama decided to give him a warning. Don't act rashly. Defending your friends is one thing, but if you transform because you lost control, you will have a lot of trouble to deal with. I know what I'm doing, Sensei. Once I find her, I'll shift back to being completely human. My own KI should be more than enough for what I have planned. After following her scent for a few minutes, Naruto found the girl on a balcony nearby, standing at the railing looking out at the surrounding area. Repressing the Kitsune Chakra he had been channeling, he silently walked up until he was next to her without her noticing. You know nothing about who is fit to lead. His sudden words caused her to jump with a small scream of surprise and take a step away from him. Where did you come from? And what in the world are you talking about? He looked at her and allowed some of his killing intent to permeate the air. She took another step back as the sense of dread hit her. Your words to Ruby not even five minutes ago. You know nothing. You think that academic success and your so-called maturity make a leader? They are insignificant in comparison to what really matters. You think it was at Ruby I looked with disgust? No. It was you and your arrogance. You think you're so much better than everyone else? That is one mark against you already as a leader. Ruby may not be a great leader yet, but she has everything it takes to become one, and she is well on her way. She will be a much better leader than you could ever hope to be. Don't ever dare to insult her again. Naruto turned and walked away, keeping his KI pressure on Weiss until he had turned the corner. He heard a thump as the girl collapsed to her knees behind him. He began walking back to where Ashbin was talking with Ruby, and he heard a chuckle in his mind. Well done, Kit. I'm willing to bet that that Ninjin won't go anywhere near you for a few days. Naruto smiled at the praise. As he came back to the area where the classroom was, he saw Ashbin walking away, leaving a more determined-looking Ruby behind. He walked up to her and said, So, did you get a good pep talk? Ruby jumped a little and turned to face him. However, she quickly looked down at the ground, remembering what Weiss had said about Naruto's opinion of her. Naruto, do, do you think I'm a bad leader? Naruto moved closer and put a hand on her shoulder. You're young, inexperienced, and you lack tactical knowledge. With each word, Ruby felt worse and worse. But that doesn't matter. She looked up at him with hope in her eyes. Age, experience, and knowledge will come later. 
Right now, you already have the most important thing for being a leader. You care about your team with all your heart. That is what matters the most. Weiss was wrong. It was her sense of superiority that disgusted me, as well as how she insulted you and assumed that I shared her opinion. Don't listen to what she says. Ruby smiled at him, tears shimmering in her eyes. Thank you. Naruto gave her shoulder a reassuring squeeze before walking in the direction of the cafeteria to get some breakfast. Ruby stood still for a few seconds before slowly following him, her smile still on her face. After breakfast, Naruto wandered the school a bit more, wanting to know the layout of the place better. Ruby had said she had some sort of work to do after she had finished eating and had disappeared in the direction of the library. As he was walking outside of the administration wings, he saw a hologram board with some official-looking posts displayed on it. He walked up to the board and began to read them. They were all headed similarly. Available D-ranked missions. Available C-ranked missions. Available B-ranked missions. Naruto was intrigued and decided to find a professor and ask about how to get a mission. So he walked in the nearest door and began to wander around, hoping to find a professor nearby. He turned a corner and saw Professor Port and Professor Ajbin talking to each other. He began to walk towards them, willing to wait for their discussion to end before asking about the missions when he heard Port saying, seen anything like it before from a student. It was extraordinary enough that he was able to damage the Borbatusk's armor at all, but to cleave through the tusks by striking the same spot three times? How did you find this boy, Headmaster? Ashbin took a sip from his coffee. You remember Glinda's report that concerned Miss Rose? Yes, but what is that? Wait, you mean to tell me that he was the boy who stepped in? Ashbin nodded. He appears to have an ability to become invisible, and I'm sure you've heard how he can use nature's wrath without dust, although it can apparently kill him if he uses it too much. I've been doing some research into exactly what semblance could produce those effects, but... Ashbin then noticed that Naruto was only about 10 feet away from them and said, Ah, Mr. Uzumaki, we were just discussing your recent battle with the Borbatusk. Is there something you needed? Naruto smiled. Well, I was walking around and saw a hologram board with some posts on it talking about available missions. I was wondering what that was about, and how I could take on a mission. Ashbin smiled. So eager already? You have to be ranked first before taking any missions, so you'll have to wait a bit longer. Fairly frequently, villages, individuals, or the Vale Police Department issue missions to beacon to do things such as hunt down packs of Grimm that are causing trouble, escort important shipments through Grimm-occupied territory, or to hunt down criminals who have managed to get their hands on too much dust. Beacon is more than just a school. Most of the time, we distribute these missions to active hunters and huntresses, but we put some missions up for students to accept. This way, our students can get some experience in the field and earn some extra money. Also, you need to complete some missions to graduate. You'll learn how the ranking system works later this week when you're tested. Naruto smiled and said, I'm looking forward to it then. Thanks for the explanation. Before he could leave, Ashpin said, I do have one question for you. What exactly is a Kakashi Sensei? Naruto busted out laughing. I forgot that I said that. Kakashi was one of my earlier sensei, or teachers. He took on me and two other students to have us work in a squad. The first day we met with him, he gave us a test. We had to take some bells from him. He told us, come at me with the intent to kill, or you will never get these bells. He also had silver hair, and your destroy everything in your path, or you will die speech just reminded me of him. Naruto bid Ashbin farewell and began to walk back towards the exit. After he had left, Professor Port looked to Ashbin and said in a shocked voice, what kind of teacher tells his students to try to kill him? Ashbin sipped his coffee. One who has absolute confidence in his own abilities and is training his students to kill. I may have to watch Naruto more closely than I previously thought. I assumed that the death of the robber at the dust shop was an accident, but now I'm not so sure. Later that night, when Naruto returned to Team Ruby's room, he saw the light on in Ruby's curtained-off area around her bed, which he had christened Fort Rose. Climbing up to the opening in the curtain, he smiled when he saw Ruby slumped over a book, asleep, an empty coffee mug next to her. Looking over at the coffee maker, he saw that there was still some fresh coffee left. He gently shook her arm to wake her. Her eyes eased open and looked at Naruto for a moment before she remembered what she had been doing and said, Ah, Naruto, I was studying and I fell asleep. Thanks for waking me up. Naruto smiled at her and said, How do you like your coffee? It took her a moment to realize what he was offering. You don't have to do that for me. I can. She was cut off when Naruto gently covered her mouth with his hand. I know I don't have to. I want to. You're putting effort into gaining knowledge, so I should do what I can to help. So, tell me, 
How do you like your coffee? Naruto didn't notice the slight blush that had appeared on Ruby's cheeks when he covered her mouth, and it had disappeared by the time he withdrew his hand. Um, one cream and five sugars. Grabbing her discarded mug, Naruto prepared the coffee to her specifications and brought it to her. Here you go. You know, without even realizing it, you're following the motto of the warriors from my home. Ruby tilted her head with a questioning look. What motto is that? If you lack heaven, seek wisdom. Become prepared. If you lack earth, seek advantages. Run in the fields. With both heaven and earth, all your efforts will bear fruit. As he said this, Naruto grabbed his pajamas and headed towards the bathroom. Ruby was confused and asked, What does that mean? Naruto paused before he entered the bathroom. You'll understand eventually, Ruby. He shut the door behind him and came out a minute later in his pajamas, then crawled into bed. Good night, Ruby. Ruby let her upper body hang over the side of the bed, her upside-down face smiling at Naruto. Good night, Naruto. And thank you. For everything. As Naruto closed his eyes, he said, My pleasure to help, Taicho. Ruby looked confused, wondering what Taicho was, but decided that it wasn't worth disturbing him further. She continued studying, and a few minutes after midnight, she set her books on the shelf next to Fort Rose and turned off her light, succumbing to sleep's sweet embrace. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.